I, I'm looking at these recipes and I see, for example, that the biscuit recipe has calls for three sticks of butter. I mean, I know that I, you can make biscuits with no butter and they, and they turn out really nicely, you know? It just seemed like a lot. I'm your host, Joy Manning, and this is Edible Potluck, a podcast that gives food lovers a taste of Edible Communities magazines. Today, we're visiting California wine country for a talk with Jennifer Reichart of Wrapped Wines. Then we're headed to D.C. to talk to Bonnie Benwick, deputy food editor and recipe editor at The Washington Post. We'll have a conversation about last year's surprising best-selling cookbook. But before that, let's have a drink, why don't we? These days, I am all about the shrub. If you've never heard of a shrub, it's a traditional vinegar syrup, and it's typically made by combining one part fruit to one part vinegar to one part sugar. Edible San Diego published a handful of recipe for shrubs, including one I mixed up right after I read it, grapefruit rosemary shrub. To make it, first you'll peel the zest from a grapefruit and remove and discard the white pith. You don't want that. You combine the zest with one cup of sugar, mashing it up with a wooden spoon or a potato masher to release the fragrant oils in the zest. Then you add the flesh of the grapefruit, you cover the container, and you refrigerate for 24 hours, at least overnight. After that, you strain out the syrup and you mix it with one cup apple cider vinegar and a sprig of rosemary. I also like to add a little pinch of salt to my shrubs. That's not in the recipe, but I feel like it gives them a a more complex flavor. You use it or follow the recipe. So you let it sit another 24 hours for flavor to really develop, and then it's ready to go. Um, This particular shrub is really complex because of the bitterness of the grapefruit peel, and um, the aromatic herbal notes from the rosemary really give it uh, something special. I like it just mixed with plain old sparkling water or tonic water. It's also a bartender's friend if you're trying to do something like a craft cocktail at home without breaking out too many ingredients. As always, I'll share the link for this recipe at ediblecommunities.com so you can mix it up for yourself. After growing up in the food business in Northern California, Jennifer Reichart decided to branch out, becoming a winemaker and starting her own label, Raft Wines. Though she's only been in the wine business since 2016, her food-friendly bottles are earning high praise, including in the pages of Edible San Francisco, which is how I was first introduced to her. Uh, Today, she's here to tell us more about her journey into the wine world. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you grew up in a family food business, um, raising ducks for Bay Area restaurants. How did that impact the kind of work you wanted to do with your life? I grew up kind of always in and around food and wine, and so while I didn't realize from the very beginning that that was what my path was going to be, it just was sort of natural um, to always be around it and to think about it and to talk about it. And, and, you know, we always had dinner together as a family. And I always knew from a very young age that I wasn't going to be working an office job that I wanted to be doing and making and be outside and not just be sitting at a computer all day. And I think that one was... Were you outside with the with the ducks a lot? <laughs> um, the, Is that like an outdoor business? Well, the ducks are in open air barns in West Petaluma. Mm-hmm. So they're definitely outside. But it was more just that my dad was... And, and my mom, you know, they were at the duck farm. They were driving deliveries around. They were at the restaurants. You know, there was, it was kind of dynamic. You know, the day to day was never the same. And that's something that I really kind of grasped onto. Um, and I knew that whatever I was going to end up doing, it was going to be something where you never know what the day is going to bring. Um, and then the wine just sort of fell into place with all of that. So, how did you get, how did you get interested in, in making wine? Um, I, always was around wineries. We always did events, you know, in wineries, we would cook duck and um, share it with wineries with their wine club members or kind of for educational experiences. Um, But it wasn't until 2011 that I actually kind of jumped into the wine on a, on a slower basis. I I worked my first harvest in 2011. And then um, after that, kept going back and forth between working at the duck farm and then working in the wine industry and then getting my SOM exam done and then working back at the duck farm and then back in the, uh, in a wine internship. So it was kind of always back and forth, um, until 2016. And then I launched draft in 2016. And now I've just split my time between Liberty ducks and raft wines. I've got two questions about yes. that. Um, one, you said, I, you know, I'm not a wine expert. Uh-huh. You said when you work 
work the harvest? What does that mean? Are you picking the grapes? I have picked the grapes in the past. Um, most harvest internships are more in the cellar or in the lab. Um, so sampling the fermenting tanks or uh, working on the fermenting tanks. So the pump overs and punch down during primary fermentation and then barreling down once primary fer- fermentation is over. Um, and then there was all my wine internships kind of involved some vineyard aspect as well, whether it was dropping fruit for quality or uh, sampling the sugar levels, the bricks um, to kind of determine ripeness. So each one was a little bit different, but not as many picking grapes. I'm not a very fast picker. (laughs) So you were mostly learning the nuts and bolts of um, making wine and sort of a little bit of the science behind making wine in those in those jobs. Exactly. Gotcha. And my other question was, um, you mentioned the SOM exam. You, you, were you studying to be a, a sommelier like you find in a restaurant? Yeah, I in between my first and my second wine harvest internships and then my third and my fourth, I did my level one and then level two sommelier exams through the Court of Master Sommeliers. And it was just kind of, I didn't know if I wanted to be on the restaurant or sales side or on the production side. And so I kind of spent took the time to really work through both of them um, and ultimately decided that production was where I wanted to be. Did you learn things in those courses that have made you a better winemaker Absolutely. or contribute to your winemaking? Yeah, it's. I love working harvest because you need to to get that hands-on experience. I don't have a degree in it. My degree is in sociology, so I always joke that I'm making wine for the people and need to know what the people would want. <laughs> um, but without that kind of hands-on nuts and bolts learning, it would be hard to do what I do now. But on the flip side, I can't work a harvest in every country and around the world, and I want to know about all those wines. So taking those exams really kind of opened my mind up to all the different styles of wine and saying, you know, hey, they're doing something really cool over there. Let's apply that to these grapes that I can get in California and see if it works. Now, sort of to the to your joke about making wine for the people, uh-huh. I have read that one of your goals is to make really great quality wine at a, at a more affordable price point. Um, why is that important to you and how do you how do you pull it off? I think that in California especially sometimes we can lose sight that wine is is and can be a grocery item. You know, you go to Italy and Spain and France and it's on the table most often dinner and sometimes even lunch and it's just kind of part of the daily culture and I don't think that it needs to be like that or I think it should be like that in California. I think we we've kind of come to a point where a lot of wines are really expensive and hard for people to afford. And I work for some amazing producers and I love their wines, but even I can't afford them. And so my peers were like, this is great, Jen, we'd love to support you, but we can't buy those bottles or we can only buy one and we're going to save it for a special occasion. And I really wanted to make wine that my friends could afford, that I could afford, um, that you know my family friends could afford and not feel like they were breaking the bank. Um, And so it's, it's not as easy to do. I think in California with the land prices, the way that they are and the, I don't own any vineyards myself. So generation, I didn't have the generational help that a lot of producers maybe in France or Italy might have, you know, it's been passed on and passed on. So that land cost isn't as big of a thing, but just trying to find grapes uh, from maybe a little more unknown appellations and unknown varieties to make some good wine. Can you give us a ballpark idea of what is an affordable price for a bottle I, in, in your mind? I'm shooting for that 20 to $30 price point. Um, I have all my wines but one are within that range, and then I have one that's 35 That's kind of maybe a little bit more special occasion. But I feel like when me and my fiancé are at home, um, we feel comfortable opening like a $20, $25 bottle for a night, you know, we might have a glass out of it that night and then save the rest of the bottle for the next night. Um, I think you can find really decent bottles for $15 even. I think there's a range depending on what you're eating and who you're with. Um, but that kind of greater 15 to $25, I'm pretty comfortable on a Tuesday night, if you will. <laughs> I'm just curious because, you know, when we talk about things being expensive or affordable, it really, mm-hmm. you know, some, depends sometimes on the on the person. Um, you said you don't, you know, you're a winemaker, you have a wine label, but you don't have a vineyard. So where do you get your grapes? I source fruit from vineyards all over California, which is really fun. Um, I'm born and raised in California and my family is fifth generation Californian on my dad's side. So I feel like very attached to the state. 
So I source fruit from all the way down near Yosemite on the southern border and then all the way up to Mendocino County um, and then as far east as El Dorado, so the Sierra Foothills, and then I have a couple in Sonoma County as well. So really kind of hitting a lot of different areas. Um, oh, and Butte County too. <laughs> There's up there too, so even more north. So it's fun to kind of see the state in in a different way and to travel through kind of the heartland of California to get to some of these vineyards. I get to see a lot of how people live and where people are living and what people are doing. And that's pretty exciting for me. How did you name your your label Raft Wine? Raft, um, what does that mean to you? A raft is actually a community of waterfowl-like ducks. So if you see a bunch of ducks or geese or any kind of water bird in a pond, it's called a raft of ducks. Um, So it was really exciting to me to find something that was both meaningful to my history and my family, but also that was new and fresh. Um, And then I also like to say that my community has kept me afloat like a raft and has kind of led me to this point in my life. And then um, even more fun, my brother is a whitewater rafting guide. So there's multiple meanings to the word, which makes it pretty special. Layers of meaning. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I love that. That's really, that's such a nice nod to your, to your family. Um, And uh, speaking of community, I was really intrigued and inspired to see that you're involved with this project called Rebuild Wine Country. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? What is that project all about? Yeah. So Rebuild Wine Country came up uh, in direct relation to the Sonoma County and Napa County fires that happened in 2017. Um, A friend of mine, Chris Streeter, is the owner of Census Wines, and he called me, and he also grew up in Sonoma County, and he's like, what do we do? Basically, at that point, the fires were nowhere near containment, and it was only a couple days in, and both of us were luckily kind of, our, our families and our projects were both spared by the fires, and so we kind of you're just sitting here watching your friend's homes burn down, kind of feeling really helpless. And so he and his team really quickly banded together and started this this um, project. And that he wrote to me in the beginning and uh, helped them kind of spread the word. And basically, they partnered with Habitat for Humanity, and they're helping to raise money to uh, rebuild the homes that were lost in Sonoma, Napa, Mendocino, and Solano counties in those 2017 fires which is pretty important. I think we've lost a lot of people who have lived here because they just don't have anywhere to go and their homes haven't been rebuilt yet and maybe they don't have the means or the insurance to rebuild them. So they were trying to find an avenue to to help those people out. Is that a project that we could link to so people could perhaps um, make a donation or get involved if they wanted yeah, to? Yeah, absolutely. There's still the website is Rebuild Wine Country um, and... I would also say to to link up with Habitat for Humanity because I think even beyond Sonoma County or beyond Napa County, they're doing really good work. You know, we see natural disasters happening everywhere right now, and they seem to be getting worse and worse. Um, so, kind of being involved at a local level with your local Habitat for Humanity is is really important right now. That's a good point and a, a good way to get involved, no matter where you are. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, when I um, Welcome you to the show. I read about your wines in uh, Edible San Francisco, and uh, specifically your 2017 Syrah was um, called out as a favorite of the editors there. So can you just tell me a little bit about what makes that wine special? Yeah, um, the, the 2017 Syrah, it's from Weed Farm. So the proprietor, Sally Weed, uh, is it's her vineyard. And well, there's a few things special about the wines. One, uh, when I started Raft Wines, those were the first grapes that came on board. Um, I've known Sally for many years and she always said, you know, when I was ready to let her know and hopefully she'd have some grapes available and she definitely did in 2017. Um, So it it had a special place in my heart for that. But uh, on the other side, she farms it very, very, very sustainably. It's kind of the coolest part about the whole wine is she has coho salmon that run along the creek um, in the vineyard and coho salmon are very endangered in California. And so it's rare to see them at all. And they actually spawn in this Creek, which is incredible. So anything that happens in the vineyard has to positively affect the Creek. So therefore it only gets pruned and it gets mowed, but there's no spraying on the ground. There's no spraying on the vine. You know, even, even if you farm organically, you're still allowed to spray things in the the vineyard and there's nothing. Um, so it's really, I think it's like the most honest expression of terroir there is because it's just the grapes. There's nothing else. And I kind of craft it in the way to really highlight all of that. 
And that's still priced in the 20 to $30 range? Yep, 27 That's really inspiring. Yeah. I love that story. Is it a good food pairing for salmon? Does it? It's a little heavy for salmon. <laughs> <laughs> Syrah in general um, is, you know, it's a darker red wine. It's not as heavy. It's not as tannic as Cabernet. Um, but I like to pair it with kind of game, gameier meats. So duck actually works really well. Or like duck. Yeah. <laughs> or um, lamb. Um, both of those work work pretty well with it. Well, that's a good tip. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. That was Jennifer Reichart, founder and winemaker of Raft Wines. Order a bottle for yourself at raftwines.com. You can follow Jennifer on Instagram at duckdaughterjj. We love cookbooks at Edible Communities. So Bonnie Benwick's recent Washington Post article, Why Did the Food Media Ignore the Best-Selling Cookbook of 2018, certainly grabbed our attention. I was surprised to learn that I'd never even heard of last year's top-selling cookbook, Magnolia Table by Joanna Gaines. Bonnie's article examines this cookbook in light of its runaway success while asking questions about what really drives cookbook sales and media coverage. Bonnie is the deputy food editor and recipe editor at the Washington Post, and she's here to tell us more. Welcome to Edible Potluck, Bonnie. Thank you for joining us. Hey there. Um, First, I have to tell you, I was completely riveted by this article, and so was our editor-in-chief at Edible Communities, Miley Watson. We were pinging each other as soon as we read it, and we knew we wanted to get you on the podcast to talk about it. Well, thank you. I think what really got us was this feeling that we were clueless about our our own industry, and I I, I sense that... um, you also, you know, were surprised by what you learned. So I, I just was wondering, how did you first learn that it was Magnolia Table that was the year's best-selling cookbook? And uh, what was your reaction? Well, uh, I'm not necessarily an investigative reporter or anything, and it didn't take uh, too much digging. But as I said in the article, you know, when the end of the year lists come out and everybody sort of has gone over what their top cookbooks are, it's uh, typically the people who get a lot of media coverage, they get on television you know, on the Today Show, you know, they get covered by the large newspapers across the country. And up front, of course, you know, Magnolia Table had been in covered by the uh, food magazines. Like, here's a couple of recipes from this new cookbook by this very popular sensation, uh, Joanna Gaines. It had sat on my desk, to tell you the truth. It came out last April, which is typically kind of a little bit of a downtime. It's right after a big crush of spring cookbooks. And so it had time to build sales from April up and through the typical fall holiday cookbook season. Um, So it had a big running start. And I I don't even know if that was part of their strategy, but they also had another cookbook. The publisher, HarperCollins, had another book by Joanna Gaines coming out, a design book that was going to get for the holidays. So I guess they were sort of figuring, this is my conjecture, not confirmed, that the two of those books together would make a nice gift for somebody. And so it picked up sales there too. And then I went to a site called Eat Your Books, which chronicles things. After the first day of the year, people start figuring out like what books really sold and where they sold. And they're kind of a champion of independent cookbook sellers. And this cookbook didn't appear on any of the independent cookbook sellers lists. Like nobody walked into a independent kitchen arts and letters and wanted to buy this book. They, they were not even really aware of it either. Uh, which is kind of surprising because you figure a store would know all cookbooks that came out, whether or not they chose to carry them, right? Right. I mean, I I think a lot of us were just not aware of this. Were you familiar with Chip and Joanna Gaines and their whole uh, HGTV show and everything before this book crossed your desk? Yeah, I I knew who they were. And I know that celebrities write cookbooks and I know that they get people to help them write cookbooks. And like I said, it had sat on my desk for a couple of months. I think I looked through it and Um, you know, this is what I tried to own up to in the article. I try to assess for the Washington Post readers, um, my end of the year list is usually longer than a lot of people's. I don't adhere to a top 10. I sort of, you know, feel the mood uh, from year to year. So it might have 15 books on it. It might have 21 books on it. These are books that I feel like offer something fresh and new and different, or it could be a 
you know, some sort of tweak or twist on traditional recipes are just really well done. And mm-hmm. what I saw when I looked through their book was I saw guacamole and I saw chili and I saw uh, biscuits and I saw, you know, there were pretty standard recipes. They didn't have a lot of twist to them. And, you know, once I saw that they had sold as many as they had sold, I, I went to Publishers Weekly. I contacted the publisher right away and just said, hey, I'm kind of interested in if you tell me what the sales are. And publishers are these days a little hesitant, I would say, and I'm underselling that, uh, to release uh, what their sales figures are. It's just not, uh, unless it's a runaway great hit like Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat was in 2017, mm-hmm. and that sold you know, over 300,000 copies. Um, but that's been two years worth, right? You know, they, they don't really want to tell you exactly what it is. Uh, I did notice in the ISBN numbers for Magnolia table that, uh, they had applied for their books to be for a copy to be in, included in the library of Congress, which is basically what that number boils down to. They'd also done separate editions with separate ISBN numbers. They'd applied for, for specifically for Costco, for Walmart, for Target. And those were not editions that looked any different, but some of them were signed editions, you know, sort of like stamp sign. Uh, So that was clear to me Mm -hmm. where they were selling their book as well as, you know, on Amazon and online where it went crazy. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that you were surprised that it was the top selling book of the year. So what would you, before you learned this, what were you expecting to see at the top of the sales pile? Not not the best or your favorite, but what, what would you have guessed was the top-selling cookbook? I think I might have said uh, the Chrissy Teigen book, the, her sequel, Hungry for More, or Ina Garten. Uh, every two years, she comes out with a cookbook, mm-hmm. and they all do very, very well. Mm-hmm. She's a, and I say this in the most generous and, and well-meaning possible light, she's a machine. She's got it down. She Her recipes work. She's got a system. She knows what she wants to do. They have a theme. Right. Uh, her recipes are accessible. They're tested dozens of times. You know, people uh, like that. So um, mm-hmm. I, I would have thought that that would have been it. And I was thinking it would be something in the, you know, 150,000 range. Mm-hmm. Where this was up over a million, right? Over a million copies sold? <laughs> yeah, they, the publisher told me they had over 2 million books in print now. And it was, as of November, it was almost 1.4 million. It's kind of shocking. Uh, Another thing that I took away from your article was um, an openness to Chrissy Teigen's book. Um, I had resisted it on the basis of it being a celebrity cookbook. And isn't her original claim to fame that she's a a model or something? I I don't know. I just had sort of um, written it off, but you liked it. So I'm actually teaching a a food writing class right now at my own local independent bookstore. They don't specialize in cookbooks, but they are an independent store. I was surprised to see they did have Magnolia Table in stock, but they did not have Chrissy Teigen's first book. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So, And when I asked the owner about it, he was like, what? My wife loves Joanna Gaines, which I guess explains the whole thing. You know, people are just into her brand. There, there's no question that if you have a face that's been on television, you get an automatic audience. Right. I I mean, uh, you can look at the Pioneer Woman, for example. Sure. But Chrissy Teigen's book, I mean, there are a couple things going for it for me. One is the recipe developer. What's like the really good term for some? It's better than a recipe whisperer. I don't mean to diminish the position at all, but Adina Sussman is an amazing, she's a cookbook author in her own right. To me, she's the equivalent of that backup singer who was in 20 feet from stardom. Mm -hmm. I mean, she could go out on the road at any minute, you know, but she's chosen to spend a lot of her career consulting and working on other people's cookbooks. And now she's doing more of her own, of course, but she moved into Chrissy Teigen's house and Chrissy Teigen has struck me. I knew a a little bit about her from her show on television, not just that she was a model, but that lip sync battle thing, you know, clearly I need to watch more television (laughs) because I am out of the loop. And she's also, she, she has a huge Twitter following. I think that really did a lot. She talks about food on Twitter a lot Mm -hmm. and about, you know, what she, what she wants to eat. I mean, sure. She's like gorgeous and seems to have a perfect life, but she also uh, admits to flaws and shortcomings and makes her seem more, all the more human for it. And Mm -hmm. uh, she just seems pretty genuine to me. You know, I, I don't begrudge it, but she cooks, she has a mother in the kitchen who cooks with her. And, and Adina came and lived with her for like weeks at a time. They went Mm -hmm. through the whole book over and over again. Uh, Adina told me, you know, off the record for this, because I interviewed her for this piece about, because I couldn't interview the woman who worked on the recipes with Joanna. 
uh, for Joanna's book. Um, you know, just sort of a feel of what it's like, right. you know, how involved, what kind of power you have in terms of negotiating this is a good thing for the book and this isn't a good thing for the book, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So that sort of brings me to something. Here's a question you probably don't know the answer to, but I'm just wondering what you think. Um, Why, why wouldn't Joanna Gaines want to talk to you about uh, her book for this article in the Washington post? I I couldn't imagine. What do you think? Mm, I think, I think she felt like she didn't need to. I guess when you've already sold over a million yeah. books. Yeah. Does she need my publicity? I, I, you know, probably not. But maybe she just wanted to move on. Hmm. I, I mean, uh, one of the things that I found, I, you know, you were struck by some things you've said, but one of the things that I found most interesting was that this book was pretty much done, you know, or definitely in production mode before the restaurant opened. Right. It, it's supposed to be Magnolia Table, the restaurant, mm-hmm. and there are these little um, sort of stamps in the bottom of a couple of pages of recipes, I'd say maybe 10 or 15% of the recipes in the book, um, say from the kitchen of Magnolia table. But as far as I know, you know, that kitchen was like being built. (laughs) Not open yet. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, that these are recipes, you know, she makes no bones of the fact that, you know, we don't even discuss the amounts of salt or butter, you know, right. I mean, It's a to me, it also seemed and that was one of the reasons why I kept looking at these recipes like an amazing amount of stuff and without any kind of acknowledgement that this was, you know, maybe this is an indulgence that you should have every now and then or I loved in the article you wrote, there was heyday Paula Dean amounts of butter. (laughs) Um, yeah. I definitely want to talk about the recipes. You mentioned that your your team tested 20 recipes from yeah. the book, which is way more than you would typically do. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, um, can you give us an idea of how many recipes from a book you might test um, typically for coverage and why you wanted to test so many more for this one? Um, if it's a cookbook that I'm going to feature for more than consideration in the end of the year list, I'll probably test about five. Mm-hmm. There are a couple of things I've learned. I, I've been uh, been working at the Post for a long time, but I've been in the food section uh, for about 15 years. And I love cookbooks like you do. I mean, I love them. They're on my bedside table. You know, all the jokes about that's my reading material at night. It is because I, I look at them for more than the recipes. But I mm-hmm. also feel like I can read a recipe now that I've learned to read it and sort of figure out whether or not it's a good one. Right. So it partially it's based on what I've seen before, whether or not they're doing something different with it, whether or not, you know, it seems like it's clear in many aspects. I I'm looking at these recipes and I see, for example, that the biscuit recipe has calls for three sticks of butter. I mean, I I know that you can make biscuits with no butter. Right. Right. And they they turn out really nicely, you know, it just seemed like a lot. So it, it, it almost seemed like I had to make them. They took a picture for the article, I guess, and I can show you, you know, these are all the post-it notes that I wow. had in the book because I just wanted to make sure I gave it a fair shot. I admit to coming in skeptical pretty hard, you know, and so I wanted to give it a fair shot. I wanted to make sure that what I was testing and really, I would say the majority of the recipes that I that we all tested and it was me, our volunteer testers, and then if they had some sort of minor episode, I would retest what they did just to see if Mm -hmm. I could create what they did. You know, they just weren't the recipes themselves. I mean, I still sort of stand by not putting it on the list, although it's a very popular book because, you know, I just didn't think there was a whole lot of stuff that was so great. Not like the people on Instagram that I interviewed who are very defensive and very positive about this cookbook. Well, you did choose one recipe to include with the story, um, the chicken tenders wild rice casserole. Um, how did you How did you choose that of all the ones that you tested? Seriously, it, it hurt my soul just a little bit. Just, just a little to bit. include it. Yeah, because the tasters, and this was food staff plus other people who come into the food lab for various reasons uh, during the day. They, I didn't, I didn't tell them a whole lot about it, but I had it there and just said, you know, we, after we shoot the food, photograph the food in the lab, we, you know, we don't do anything to it. You know, that means you can't eat it. Like we don't Mm -hmm. put, you know, mineral oil on it or anything. So, uh, people come by and they taste what it is and people were eating it and they liked it. I mean, you know, I had sort of busted it up into portions so they didn't really see what the casserole itself looked like, which I didn't think was 
really all that appetizing. I mean, but, you guys really make food look appetizing in the photos, generally speaking. And oh, thank you. I don't think I don't <laughs> think this casserole looked very tasty. And I broke my rule of never reading the comments to read what Washington Post readers thought. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they thought it looked very appetizing either. No, they didn't. We we did not go out of our way to make these things look any better than they should. I mean, when it came out of the oven, that's what it looked like. Tasters in the in the lab said it reminded them of stuff their mother made, you know, when they asked what was in it, I told them and they were right. They sort of put their fork down. For you know, listeners who maybe haven't seen this recipe yet, it's mm -hmm. basically like Uncle Ben's wild rice mixed with a cream of something soup and then chicken tend like two pounds of chicken tenders just draped on top and then baked for with kind butter, of a long time. With, with oh, more of course. butter brushed on top of the <laughs> oh. Chicken, and the bacon. Dinners. It has bacon in the bottom, right? See, that was the thing about it. That You know, I, if I had been testing that recipe and I wanted to put it forth for post readers, I would have crisped up that bacon and then put it on the bottom. I could see right. how you'd get, even if it wouldn't stay crispy, but it would have, it would have rendered fat before I mm -hmm. put it in. You know, they used uncooked bacon to line the bottom and the sides of the pan. And so, so weird. Yeah. And so there was so much rendered fat that the tester told me she had to pour it off. And when she put it back in and then put the thing with the butter on top, it was spattering all over her oven. Yeah. But and this was not an isolated incident with the spattering in terms of your testing. <laughs> no, no, there was, there was multiple spattering because this book has a lot of butter in it, salted yeah. butter too. So interesting. Yeah. Well, has this whole experience changed the way that you assess cookbooks as they come across your desk? Do you feel like it's changed your perspective? Uh, I feel... I feel like there's a dual conversation going on with cookbooks. I have to say, even though we do this end of the year list at the Post, for many years, I would do cookbook reviews. Other people would do freelance cookbook reviews for us. And then Joe Yonan, the food and dining editor, just sort of said, you know, they don't really get a lot of traffic and maybe we should put our efforts in other things. And so we just stopped doing them. And mm -hmm. we didn't get one person, not one, who wrote in and said, hey, what happened to all those reviews? So the end of the year reviews or whether they were going to give them away really seemed to be all that people needed, mm -hmm. uh, which made me wonder, like, where were they getting their information about cookbooks? I asked people on Facebook and on Twitter, and they said, oh, well, we read... Amazon reviews and we get word of mouth from our friends. And I'm thinking, well, the you don't even know who's writing the Amazon reviews. So I, I don't know if how the food media covers cookbooks makes people buy more cookbooks than they would have bought anyway. Does that right. make sense? It does. Yeah. And I, I mean, I couldn't help but think that there's just multiple segments of the audience that we're all, you know, writing for. Um, I mean, Magnolia Table cookbook fans might not necessarily be edible communities fans, for example. You know, I think yeah. our, our audience is really into the farmer's market and local food. Um, but at the same time, it is one big readership, you know, um, and clearly its success means means something. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what it means, but I'm going to continue to think about it. Well, I would say that these recipes are somewhat analogous to everything that you can find on allrecipes.com, mm -hmm. except you just don't get the reader comments. So maybe this is a constituency that likes having a nice book on the shelf. Uh, this is These are people who really trust Joanna and Chip Gaines' uh, level of taste, and they appreciate that kind of cooking that uses... Remember Sandra Lee and Semi yep. Homemade, you know? I, I sure mean, do. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, it's convenience cooking for a reason. And my mother, I, I did it. I was sort of raised on this kind of casserole. I love tuna cat. I mean, I, you know, I'm not a non casserole person, but I think we've learned over the years to make it a little healthier. Maybe you can make your own bechamel sauce or something right, like that. Right. Right. Not everybody has the time and not everybody wants to feel guilty about food and not everybody wants to pay what maybe we ought to be really be paying for farmer's market ingredients true, and things. True. So I think the bottom line is for me, the difference is people who, who like this kind of cooking don't really rely on people like me at the Washington Post to give them a recipe like that. They can find it lots of places. Right. You know, what I try to do is try to find recipes that are approachable, but maybe offer something a little different or easier than, yeah. than what's in the book. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, it was definitely a 
perspective that I was not um, considering. So I really appreciate you bringing it to my attention. Um, thank you. And I feel like it gives me a wider sense of our food culture. Um, so thank you for that and um, your tremendously interesting article. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was Bonnie Benwick, deputy food editor and recipe editor at The Washington Post, where she writes the weekly Dinner in Minutes column. We'll link to her article, Why Did the Food Media Ignore the Best-Selling Cookbook of 2018, in the show notes for today's episode. Follow her on Instagram at bbenwick and Twitter at Bonnie Benwick. Thank you for joining us today on Edible Potluck. Our podcast producer is David Wolf. If you like this episode, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Please take a moment to leave us a rating or a review. You know it helps other listeners find the podcast. Don't forget to pick up a copy of your own local Edible magazine. If you don't know where to get one, find out at ediblecommunities.com. You can find links to everything we talked about today in the show notes for this episode at ediblecommunities.com slash podcast. Until next time, remember, eat local. Eat local.